This podcast is brought to you by Sankoff Criminal Law, where we specialize in providing defense lawyers with timely, helpful assistance on complex files. Do you need a hand with an appeal or a complex motion? Is the trial judge pestering you for written submissions? Perhaps you want someone to look over the judge's proposed jury charge and see where it's going wrong. Get Professor Sankoff on your side. Contact us at 587-337-9133 and see how Sankoff Criminal Law can help you get the absolute best results for your clients. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Criminal Defense Essentials podcast. And I am here today on Zoom all by myself. We have not yet sorted out the kinks of getting people in and uh, figuring out how to deal with all this newfangled technology. Uh, I don't know if Zoom links are going to work because I did like having people when I did the podcast, but I'm going to record today's podcast on my own. I've got a lot to say, as always, and um, we will figure this out as we go. But thanks for uh, staying in touch with the Criminal Defense Essentials podcast. I hope uh, you continue to find it a useful podcast. Not surprisingly, we will be skipping over the Q&A segment of today's uh, session because we don't have anybody to ask you questions. I could ask myself questions that might be entertaining and maybe I'll do that, but we'll see how it goes. I've got some new glasses. Thanks for asking um, here for you today. And I'm happy to be recording this uh, from my office. So what is going on? It's been a lot of fun. Like we're doing some crazy stuff in our office. We just got new business cards. I'm going to show them to you for those watching this on the video version. There you go. I got some business cards. Those are fun. I also got some criminal defense essentials cards. There you go. Um, And those are also fun. All right. We have someone here. Fantastic. So um, we're going to, we're, we're doing a lot of fun stuff. We've added a new, um, our new associate Shireen started this week, which is really great. Our office is growing. We're doing lots of fun work. I just filed an appeal in a case you might have heard of, the Bradley Barton case. The appeal has now been filed, and uh, we are excited about that. And uh, yeah, I'm getting to do some great work. We're working for lawyers across the country, providing all sorts of legal solutions to problems, Uh, sometimes really short pieces of advice. I work on an hourly rate. I help lawyers on uh, figuring out how to approach a legal matter or a file. Those are great too. I do jury charge consults. A lot of those we're helping lawyers with their jury charges. So if you ever want to get want to get in touch with us, just send me an email at peter at sankoffcriminallaw.com if you think we can help you and we'll discuss how to work that out, whether it's a legal aid case or a private retainer, and we'll figure all those things out. That's what our business is. We're trying to do uh, something that most lawyers don't do, which is help other lawyers because I've just come to the belief that the criminal law has gotten so complicated that uh, it's hard not to realize um, that lawyers need help on complex matters. And the funny thing about that as well is I gave a speech, I think I might have mentioned this last week, to the provincial court judges of British Columbia. And essentially the theme of the speech was how confusing sexual assault trials have become. And, you know, let's just say, I can't say what they said, but it was, uh, there was, there was a lot of understanding. I'm going to go that far with what I was talking about. So that's been pretty interesting too. Um, In legal terms today, the big news is still those two Supreme Court cases that have come down. I'm going to have some other cases to talk about. As you know, last week I went in depth into Brown. I thought it was an interesting discussion. Um, I've now written that up for those of you who are subscribers to the... um, to the um, uh, criminal defense essentials. The golden thread is coming out in a couple of weeks and I've written a really detailed summary of what I spoke about last week. And of course, I'll be doing a case alert on that as well if you missed last week's podcast. But I just think Brown's a really important decision and I'm not gonna revisit what I talked about last week, but I will say that the thrust of my position is that it's not just interesting on extreme intoxication. It has lots of other little tidbits in it as well. And that is uh, very, very common. When the Supreme Court gets into something, it's going to get into something. Um, I did want to have one other note um, for today, but um, oh, hold on. Somebody wants to come in. So I'm going to send them the link. 
Oh, actually, I'm going to let my wife send the link. That'll be faster. Uh, hold on. Maybe I will send the link. Uh, not. Hold on. Let's send them the link. There you go. I did want to, there is an interesting legal tidbit from uh, this morning. For those of you who do not keep up on all these things, it's always uh, interesting to, if you don't follow the Supreme Court of Canada on Twitter, well, you're missing some stuff because like they sort of keep track of what's going on in the Supreme Court of Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada um, uh, granted leave to appeal today in a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in a, um, um, in a decision out of Quebec uh, called the Queen and Marchand, which is a pretty interesting uh, little case, I think. I, I'm a little bit surprised. It's another Section 12 case. There's been quite a few of those, but I guess there has been some disparate uh, jurisprudence in, in, in the various courts about luring and the mandatory minimum punishment for luring. So this is the court is going to take on the mandatory minimum punishment for luring. Um, and the question will also be whether there are ways in which you should measure section 12. And they actually, they actually went into section one, uh, which has never or very rarely been done in terms to see if you could justify a cruel and, and unusual punishment, uh, given the number of people it affects. So I think Marshall is going to be an interesting one to watch. Um, we had always thought that the mandatory minimums um, are on their way out. There was an interesting article by David Lametti in The Star talking about how mandatory minimum punishments are flawed, and yet the liberal government refuses to repeal them. They're repealing some of them but not all of them. And there's way too many um, in there for my liking. So that's interesting. But anyway, I, I thought I would point that out to you. I try to keep track of uh, what the Supreme Court is doing. And I do think it's going to be interesting that they are uh, getting into uh, this issue of Section 12 once again. If you were a little late in showing up, I was just talking about the Supreme Court's decision to grant leave to appeal today in a case called Marchand, out of Quebec, uh, the judgments in French, but you can always get a Google translated, which is uh, essentially a constitutional mandatory minimum case for luring. So there we go, a fun uh, sort of case to uh, uh, get your, you know, looking for the future of what goes on in that particular uh, area of the law. Okay, now I want to get into, uh, I've talked a little bit about my general stuff that's going on. There's tons going on, as always. We're really busy here, and I'm actually hoping to take a little break just because, uh, oh, sorry, there is no, there's no, I, it's amazing. We just start the podcast, but there's no podcast next week because I'm in Montreal. I'm doing a judges conference uh, for the Quebec Superior Court judges. Uh, interestingly enough, that's really going to be fun. I'm, I'm pretty excited about it because it's going to be my first chance ever. Isn't that crazy? Ever to give a speech in my home province. <laughs> it's crazy. Like I have now, if I think, let's go through it, right? I'm just going to do it quickly. Places I have given speeches in this country. You ready? BC, yes, was just there. Alberta, obviously. Uh, Saskatchewan, many times. Manitoba, only once, but it's been done. Ontario, many, many times. Um, New Brunswick, plenty of times. Nova Scotia, four or five. Uh, I have never given a speech in Newfoundland. I have never given a speech in PI. And I have never given a speech in Nunavut or the Yukon, but I have given a speech in North Northwest Territories. So, the, but like all of those sort of make sense, but I've never been invited to give a speech in my home province. So not only am I excited, but I've already planned to give the first part of the speech, which will surprise the hell out of them in uh, French, because I speak French and, uh, you know, they think they're getting the professor from Alberta and my presentations in English, because I couldn't be bothered to write all the PowerPoints in French. My French isn't that good, uh, but I will give my opinion opening remarks, which will be quite heartfelt because I'm very excited to be speaking to uh, the Quebec judges. You know what that's like, by the way. You, you're not all from Quebec, but like, 
you know, if you do presentations for a living, like I do, it's kind of nice to go home, right? I always wanted to do something big at home and have my family come. They're not coming to this, but um, they've, they've, they've seen me speak, but they've had to travel to Ontario to see me speak. So uh, it's kind of fun that I'm doing this one in uh, my home province, not my hometown, but my home province. So I'm going to be in Montreal, which means no podcast next week. Sorry, we just got the Zoom links. For those of you here and not here, that link is good forever. I've made it a repeating link every, thir uh, every Thursday at this time. Okay, let's get down uh, to some business because I want to talk about the interesting aspects of the other Supreme Court decision. Last week, I went so long on Brown that I didn't get to anything that was going on in Sullivan. And the funny thing is, I tweeted on Twitter that to me, Sullivan was the more interesting decision, which I kind of think it is. Well, now that I've re read Brown more fully, I, I do think Brown's more interesting, but Sullivan is pretty darn interesting. And it's a case that I think the defense bar needs to be aware of. And let me explain why. So Sullivan is all about stare decisis. That's the only thing it's about. It doesn't really talk about extreme intoxication. It is simply a case of stare decisis. Now, to understand stare decisis, you really need to go back to old English common law. And if you don't think I'm going to take the opportunity to put on my English accent and speak as Lord Blackstone, well, then you don't know me very well, because that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the immortal words of Lord Blackstone, who said in 1783, that it is an established rule to abide by former precedents where the same points come again in litigation, as well to keep the scales of justice even and steady and not liable to waver with every new judge's opinion. That was Lord Blackstone. Now, coming back to me, it's the first thing I teach in law school, the idea that similar cases should be decided similarly. And it's based on very fundamental concerns about fairness that are innate to who we are as people. In fact, when I explained it to my kids in translating criminal law, they got it instantly. Everyone understands that I want to be treated the same way as that guy. It's not quite that simple. And sorry to say it doesn't work exactly that way. But by and large, the basic idea is that for the law to function in a way that's predictable and fair, we need to have some, you know, similarity when situations arise and that they're all going to get treated the same way. It's sort of a fundamental idea of the rule of law, because if it's, done, it's not done that way, it's going to be the rule of arbitrariness where every decision maker is going to make a different decision. So at its core, equality and fairness are really what stare decisis is all about. Also finality, which we're going to come to, but really, it's really about ensuring fair outcomes to everybody. Now, stare decisis is not that simple because um, I want to talk about two types of stare decisis. One of them is simple, because when I teach this in law school, again, when I, what I teach to them is that stare decisis works best when it works vertically. Well, what does that mean? Well, we're in a federal system. So most importantly, what you know is at the top of that federal system is one super duper court called the Supreme Court, which we're going to talk about. But other than that, the Supreme Court is really a court of 13 jurisdictions. Yes, it is. It is the ultimate court of appeal for every jur It's actually 14 because there's the federal court system as well. So you've got 10 provincial courts, three territorial courts, and then the federal court, which is the federal court system. And the Supreme Court sits at the top of them. That's why when the Supreme Court rules on a decision, that's the end of that. No one can depart from that except the Supreme Court and occasionally the Alberta Court of Appeal. But leave that alone. Let's, say, let's not go there, right? Um, the Supreme Court can depart from its own precedents, but doesn't like to do so. And um, everybody else has to follow the Supreme Court. There you go. Vertical uh, stare decisis also works well within a precedent, uh, province. So in Alberta, the Alberta Court of Appeals is the Supreme Court of the province, and lower courts all have to follow the Alberta Court of Appeal. Done. So if the Alberta Court of Appeal says something, the Alberta Court of Queen's bench judge can't say, I don't want to follow them unless it, no, 
there's one or two judges who do that, but that's not the way it works, right? And then the provincial court follows the superior court and down the line. Now, it's also well known that outside of the jurisdiction, there is no stare decisis that's binding. Absolutely not. So if a case in Ontario, even at the appellate level, Ontario Court of Appeal, an Alberta provincial court judge does not have to follow that precedent. There's no rule that says they should. They should, you know, apply the precedent if they agree with it. And it's very persuasive, but they are only bound between decisions in the vertical hierarchy. Great. We're all good so far. Okay. Out of province, not binding. In province, higher, binding. Sullivan doesn't deal with any of that. All that's accepted. But here's what Sullivan does deal with. What is called horizontal stare decisis. Now, what is that? Well, how do the rules of stare decisis apply when the decision is at the same level? And the reason for that is because in the Queen's bench, for example, there are 50 or 60 odd judges. So if one judge says something, is that it? That's the question. And the real question arises in the context of constitutional applications. Because for ordinary decisions, it's not really as pressing, but to be fair, the same rules apply according to the Supreme Court in constitutional and non-constitutional applications. But the reason this came up in Sullivan is this, is because the question seems to be more pressing with constitutional adjudication. And the reason for that is because the section 52.1 of the of the Constitution Act gives judges the power to strike a law down. At least that is the common parlance, no longer to be used, according to the Supreme Court in, um, in um, um, Sullivan. Sorry, I'm just sending someone a link who's a latecomer here. There you go. Come on and join us. Um, so, you know, that is, that is, that is the way this works, is this question of constitutional invalidity. Because what happened in Sullivan is one judge says, I am striking this law down. It's of no force or effect. So when it went to a second court, they said, well, you can't, you have to not apply it. It's dead. The law is dead when one judge declares it dead. That's the issue for the Supreme Court to decide in Sullivan. Is a law dead once the judge decides it? So the trial judge in Chan, there are two cases. Sullivan, the judge strikes it down. No issue there. Chan. In Chan, the judge considers, am I bound by Sullivan? And the trial judge said, well, you know what? There are different views on this topic. So I don't, this is an exact quote. I don't feel constrained to follow one school of thought over the other. So I've looked at everything. And despite what they just said last week in Sullivan, I'm saying stare decisis does not apply. There you go. So the question for the Supreme Court is the following. When is a court bound by a decision of what is called coordinate jurisdiction? Or more importantly, because this is constitutional, when is a declaration issued under Section 52 to strike down a law binding on a court of coordinate jurisdiction? So just like Brown, this is a unanimous decision. And remember that Sullivan goes up in this case and says the following. Sullivan's argument is pretty straightforward. Well, the declaration renders the law null and void, right? So therefore, if it's null and void, no one else can apply it. That's the power of a, a declaration of unconstitutionality. But the Supreme Court says, no, 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 that's, we use words like no force and effects, like those are the words we use, but like a declaration is simply an ordinary judicial determination on a question of law. And I think that's got to be right. I think it has got to be right that like, it's nice to think of no force or effect means it's dead, but that just, that doesn't ring true because like those decisions are often overruled and sometimes they're not applied. And it's just, they also point out it wouldn't make sense in the provinces. How can a law be dead in one province and not dead in another? And, and judges just don't kill laws. They find them of no force and effect. The laws are still on the books. And the court actually says that in a great line which I wish they'd sometimes adhere to in other cases. They say the judges of this court are judges, not legislators. Oh, 
Don't think I didn't cite that back to them in my recent Barton appeal, where I'm worried that the court is trying to create new exceptions to, you know, consent, which I don't think exists because you're not legislators, you're judges. That's what I said. And I said, you shouldn't do this. So great line in there too. They said that striking down the law is more a figure of speech than actually what's going on. And again, I think that's right, too. That's the only way this makes sense, because the laws are of no force and effect, but they're still on the books. Only parliament can repeal those laws. So therefore, the real question is whether a judge has to adhere to that, right? Because the law is not dead. Otherwise, every time one judge in PEI declared a law of no force and effect, that would have impact for the whole country because it's dead one way or another. It doesn't work that way. And I think the Supreme Court was on very solid footing here. Now, they still went on to say, well, judges should follow the decisions of other judges that are horizontally binding. Why? Well, first of all, it's good for judicial comedy. There's a lot of advantages. And I remember how this worked because I ran a constitutional challenge in a case called JS in Alberta. And the, the Crown chose not to appeal when they lost. Struck down section 278.92 in this province. For a while, some crowns were running around saying, you know what, that's only binding in that court. You got to run it again. And I'm like, this is absolutely idiotic. I was sending defense lawyers across Alberta like a factum. Like, because like, it was a two day hearing to strike it down before a judge. It's a really bad idea to be wasting resources to try and relitigate this every time the crown doesn't like the decision. Really, if the crown doesn't like the decision, it should appeal. That's the better way of dealing with it. However, the court also noted that like, yes, the judicial decisions should be followed, but an incorrect constitutional decision causes a lot of damage. It does. So it would be one it would be unwise to bind every court through one decision because you can get a bad decision from a judge and then you're sort of stuck with it. And that's a problem too. So the real question is, how do we balance these two ideas? How do we balance the idea that on one hand, we need to have stability and predictability. And on the other hand, we need to be able to make sure the law is correct. Well, the Supreme Court comes up with the following solution. Ready? Decisions of horizontal courts, right? Same court level should be respected unless one of three situations occur. One, a subsequent decision of a higher court, an appellate decision, has affected the validity of the decision. So that's number one. And that can be any aspect of the decision. And for those of you who are wondering about that, so for example, let's see, let's say like a court decides something in Ontario and Alberta, and they both strike the law down. But in Alberta, they don't they don't appeal, but in Ontario they do. In Ontario, they actually go up, right? And they actually um, they actually appeal the decision successfully. Well, in Alberta, like at that point. I think you could question and say, well, we need to rehear this because we now have appellate authority that says otherwise. But I don't even think it needs to be that direct. I think if there's anything in an appellate decision from another province that casts doubt on the logic that leads to a decision, well, then you can you can appeal again, and I, or sorry, or raise it and say to the judge, you don't have to follow that. And again, I think there's logic to that. I think that makes sense because I think otherwise you risk a decision that's really bad. You have to wait for the appeal process to take place and that can do a lot of damage. Like let's say parliament puts in a law and it's a good law. Okay, I, whatever. And somebody challenges on the constitution and judge whatever says, no, that's crazy law. I don't like it, boom, it's dead you know, defense lawyers rejoice, but like with my law professor hat on, I'm like, I'm not sure that's a good idea because like now everybody's bound by that. And like, you know, the judgment is clearly wrong. I look at it the next day and says, Sankoff says it's wrong. Well, like you can't just force everybody to live under that. Like at a certain point where something's clearly wrong, you've got to be able to have another court take another look. Now, let me be clear that the court says that. They say subsequent appellate decisions, one. Two, the decision was reached pure in curium, which is a Latin phrase. I should use my Latin voice, but my Latin phrase that effectively says it was reached without considering a major authority. 
Like it's essentially it's wrong because it's wrong. Um, but that's a high bar, not easy. Next, the judgment was taken in exigent circumstances. So sometimes judges make decisions very quickly on the basis of oral submissions. Yes, in those cases, you don't have to uh, you know, apply the stringent test. So what this all means is the following. I think by and large, it's good to know that when somebody gets a ruling of unconstitutionality, the Crown only has a couple of choices. They can either appeal that decision or that decision is largely going to be binding in the province, right? It's going to be binding because that's what was there. So I think that's really good because it saves a lot of efficiency and resources. The last thing you want to do is be going and arguing all over the province that the same law is unconstitutional. It's just a terrible idea, except that I'm concerned. Big surprise. I'm always concerned, but I am a little concerned. I, I, I'm going to explain to you what my concerns are, and then you can take them or leave them if you don't think they're good concerns. But, uh, you know, and by the way, I only have a few people here, uh, but I'm going to be getting, I will allow you to ask questions if you have any, throw in questions, comments. They don't have to be about this. They can be about anything else, because otherwise I'm just going to end it when we're done um, with this discussion. So any questions you want to throw at me for whatever, I will answer them. Just you go crazy, write something in the chat or tell me you want to raise it and we'll figure it out. Okay. I, I'm a little worried about this and I'm going to tell you why. It has to do with two problems. I like the idea by and large, but here's my two problems. Ready? Problem number one, appeal routes. What? It's a good idea to have one decision bind the judgments of the other courts. Uh, unless there are reasons why the Crown or accused can't appeal. That is a concern to me because I think we're making these decisions and the Supreme Court seems to make its decision in this case without mentioning appeal routes. And I think appeal routes are a problem because it's good to say, well, we're bound unless somebody does something else. But like, what if you can't or won't appeal the trial judge's judgment? Like, I think that's a problem. So from the Crown perspective, you'd think that the Crown is in a better position. Well, the Crown's not always in a great position to appeal. Like sometimes, for example, the accused is acquitted. Now, if the accused is convicted, it's the accused's choice to appeal. But that's the other problem. Like if the accused is acquitted, the Crown can appeal, but it can't always appeal easily because like, what if the appeal has no bearing on the acquittal? Like, I think there's some unfairness there to an accused who gets dragged along to an uh, appeal process where the Crown's not really trying to argue that the conviction should be overturned. Like, how does the Crown go up in good conscience and say, well, we want to appeal this decision just on the constitutionality of uh, an interim decision? You can't appeal interim decisions in a case anyway. So there are some little questions about how the criminal code deals with constitutional uh, uh, question appeals. And I wish there was a better way to do it. Now, keep in mind, what if the accused is convicted? How does the Crown appeal then? Like the criminal code doesn't seem to allow them to appeal. There is authority at the Supreme Court that says you can try to seek leave to the Supreme Court under Section 40 of the Supreme Court Act. But I'll be honest, like that doesn't seem very effective to me either. Like anytime, <laughs> anytime <laughs> the law produces a problem and the answer to that problem is seek leave to the Supreme Court of Canada, we have a bigger problem like that because like the Supreme Court of Canada is not the best place to be dealing with these issues because it's hard to get leave. So in theory, let me just explain. This is the crown perspective right now. Okay, got it. Accused convicted. Crown has no right of appeal automatically under the criminal code. They have a leave to appeal right to the Supreme Court. That's clear. It's been said. So like at this point, the crown's got to try and seek leave. But if the court, Supreme Court says, yeah, you know what? One of the issues for the Supreme Court is ripeness, ripeness, right? Which means that it's been mooted enough across the country. So again, I'll just give you a, a hypo. It comes to Alberta. Alberta is the first case. Alberta, judge says, I'm striking this down. Goes on to the case, accused is convicted. Okay, well, what does Alberta do now? Like they can try and seek leave to appeal, but the court will go, be good to get a couple other constitutional decisions before we hear this. Meanwhile, in Alberta, there's this really important law that's dead. Like, I just don't think that's a good idea. 
Like, I'm just not convinced this is the way. I suppose in theory, the government can issue a reference on the decision to the court of appeal. But again, like it would be so much cleaner if the appeal routes allowed for constitutional questions to be raised more easily. But let's just say that my concerns about the crown pale in comparison to my concerns about the defense. And, And the reason I say that is because like the decision in Sullivan doesn't firmly say whether this applies to declarations of constitutionality as well, right? So it's been upheld. Do you have to follow the judgment of the other judge? But let's just say that the wording of the judgment screams that it does. Use this formula and that's it, right? So when can you re-challenge it? Very simply. In Curium, nope, it was a good decision. It was pretty well written. New appellate authority, we don't have one, right? We don't have one. And um, it was done in a rush. Now it was fully argued. Okay, so according to the Supreme Court, you're bound. And the decision is the law is constitutional. It's wrong, I say. That's a bad decision. Lots of people are going to be negatively affected by it. And what does the accused did? Well, the accused, unlike the crown, is not an entity. So like the idea that the accused can just appeal is false. Two things. One, if the accused is acquitted, they can't appeal and shouldn't. So keep in mind, in a situation where the law is upheld and the accused is acquitted, the accused has no right of appeal, even to the Supreme Court. There's no reason why they would do so. Why? But every other accused person in the province, as far as I can tell, is screwed by that. I I don't think that's a good result. That doesn't make sense to me. Moreover, even if the accused is convicted, there's nothing to force that accused to appeal. They might not have the money, the interest, they got a low sentence. Like the accused is not an institutional entity like the crown. And I just told you that the crown's appeal routes are not great, but at least they have them in every case. Whereas the accused is not an individual entity. So they don't always have rights to to appeal decision of constitutionality. And those decisions might have hugely negative impacts for people across the province. But according to the Supreme Court in Sullivan, we are bound by those. And I'm not really happy about that. And I'll just also say, okay, Peter, well, you're overstating this too. Because eventually, all that has to happen, right, is that every other accused should raise the issue anyway, which is true. They all won't, though because it's expensive, they won't bother, they won't know, they'll think it's binding. Like the accused in the defense bar is not an institutional entity. But whatever, let's just say Judge A says, this law is constitutional for Mr. X who's acquitted. Mr. Y comes up and just says, okay, I'm gonna raise a pro forma constitutional question, which they should do. I think that is the result, by the way. Raise a pro forma constitutional question. Justice, I understand that you are bound by the decision of the other judge. I also understand that um, the three exceptions set out in Brown don't apply, but I have to raise the objection anyway, and I know you're going to deny it, and that's fine, because I need to preserve my right of appeal. So first of all, we have to do that stupidity, which I don't think is a good way to do it, but that's the way it is. So we're going to preserve the right of appeal, and, and we're going to head up. I don't like that either. I just don't. And why don't I like it? Because like, there's no record. It's not a fully argued application. Like the record and the full argument that helps inform the Court of Appeals decision was in the other case. Like you don't have access to the record. I guess you could produce it as an exhibit, but it's just messy. You don't have a trial judgment. You haven't gotten the facts applied to this particular case. There is no evidentiary record in this case. So now I've got to make a motion to admit new evidence. It's just, it's cumbersome. I don't like anything about it. I think what really needs to happen is that constitutional questions and the ability to raise them on appeal needs to be altered. I frankly think that the Crown should have a right of appeal on any decision of a constitutional nature, uh, sorry, on a statute, on constitutional legitimacy, without going to the Supreme Court. That should just be crafted as a matter of statute. Like, that's it. Just craft as a matter of statute, Crown. And get this, I think the defense should too. 
I think the defense, like notice there are enough defense bar organizations in every province that the, the crown, the, the government should have the obligation to notify them of any decision where a constitutional breach has been upheld on a law that's been challenged. And then give, if the, if the accused has no right to go forward, standing should be given to an independent body or not independent, but a body representing uh, a third party body with standing granted as per the statute that allows them to appeal. Like, I don't think this is a perfect solution either, but I'm sort of out of perfect solutions. Like, I do believe that this, this decision in Brown, uh, Sullivan, as well intentioned as it is, and by and large, I agree with it, finality, lack of duplication of resources. Yes, 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 I agree. All those things are important. But at the end of the day, I'm not convinced they're important enough. And at the end of the day, I'm also uh, not convinced that um, these are what should be determining whether or not appeals get to take place. So those are my thoughts on Sullivan. And, um, you know, I think I've done a very fulsome podcast. And since I have no questions that I can see, unless I'm missing them, I'm going to wrap it up for today. I, I really appreciate the few people who did join me. Uh, those of you who did join me, you have the link. You don't need to email it every week. That link will be fully operational next week. Not next week. There's no podcast next week. And uh, I hope you uh, join me again. Tell your friends uh, and get all that stuff uh, going. But um, yeah, thanks so much for coming out today. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And for those of you listening online, I hope you enjoy it as well. And have a great day.